Now for the first time on TV, the stories and reports of the people who fly and the aircraft they fly. And you are invited in an exciting, pulse-pumping new television series designed for everyone who has ever gazed skywards and dreamt of slipping the bonds of Earth. The Aviators. This week on The Aviators, we show you just how simple a typical cross-border flight can be. Okay guys, uh, everything looks good here. We find out all about globetrotting pilot Robert Gannon's around the world journey. Amphibs and seaplanes get wet and wild at Sun and Fun Splash In. And we see how a pilot and his Lake Buccaneer are helping the environment. From the Boundary Bay Airport, this is The Aviators. General aviation pilots in Canada and the United States share the same enjoyment of the freedom of the skies. For the most part, they can head out to their local airfield, jump in their airplane and fly to wherever they please. A big exception to this is when they have to cross the border into the neighbor's country. For some pilots, the simple thought of crossing the border is horrifying. They have tons of questions running through their head and fear potentially serious consequences. Will I have to file a mountain of paperwork? What happens if I do that wrong? What if the border guards don't like me? Are they going to tear apart and search my airplane? When I cross the border, am I going to be greeted by jet fighters? Given heightened border security, it's understandable that pilots may have some of these fears. However, on today's Aviators, we'll show you a typical cross-border flight that's actually a lot simpler than most people think. Today we're heading from Canada into the United States. Our departure point is the Brampton Flight Center just outside Toronto and we've selected Chicago Executive Airport in Chicago, Illinois as our destination. Today's flight will be taking us through clouds and we've filed an instrument flight plan. The flight will also take us over two great lakes, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. And as we approach the American coast of Lake Huron, we cross the American border with little fanfare and no fighter interception. Approaching a waypoint over the Peck Michigan VOR, I make first contact with American air traffic control. Cleveland Center, Charlie Foxtrot, Lima, Romeo, India, reporting over Peck, level 4000. Charlie Foxtrot, Lima, Romeo, India, Roger, report one zero miles southwest of Peck. We'll report one zero miles southwest of Peck, Charlie Fox, Lima, Romeo, India. A short while later, and we're crossing over Lake Michigan and in the home stretch on our way to Chicago. All right, so we just crossed the Michigan border and we're now over Lake Michigan. The next time we see land in a few minutes will be Chicago. You know, pilots shouldn't be afraid to cross a border to uh, either do a day trip or go on vacation because, I mean, if that's where the sites are and that's where you want to go, you've got the freedom to fly. You shouldn't let a border stop you. There's really not a lot different than preparing for any other flight if that flight will take you across an international border. The only other thing that you really have to do is check in with customs. And uh, when we touch down on Chicago, in the beautiful downtown uh, Chicago area, as you'll see, we'll be greeted by uh, the customs agents who will check us in, just like if you were at an international airport on an airliner or crossing a border in your car. Very much the same thing. Reading us on the ground in Chicago were two very friendly customs and border protection officers. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Chicago Executive Airport. Uh, go ahead and step off the airplane and we'll process your arrival. From the aircraft, we headed inside to clear everyone on board. Prior to the flight, I filed with CBP's EAPIS, or Electronic Advanced Passenger Information System. This notifies Customs and Border Protection who will be flying on board the aircraft, what we're carrying, what our exact routing will be, and what type of aircraft we'll be flying in on. I also phoned ahead to the port of entry that we were flying into. You can't just fly into any airport in the US or Canada. When flying into another country, the first airport you touch down at has to be the customs port of entry. What this really means is that there has to be a customs officer there to greet you, such as Officer Brian Bell. Today we have the uh, arrival of an international flight. In the preparation, after the pilot in command files his EAPIS, we'll go ahead and run the names of the passengers and crew against various law enforcement databases. If everything comes back, fine, we have no issues. If we have somebody of interest, we may send two or three officers out to greet the aircraft. Customs paperwork can always make people nervous, 
But according to Brian, they're there to help, and there's no need to worry if you make an honest mistake. In the event you should make an error in your EAPIS filing, or make a mistake in the entry process, our Customs and Border Protection officers are going to work with you. If it was an honest-to-goodness mistake, we're all human. We make mistakes. Inside the CBP office, Brian and his fellow officer check all of our passports, ask us a few simple questions. Any food, fruits, plants, agricultural products that you, you brought on the aircraft today? Yep. And check my pilot's license and medical certificate to make sure they're current. Okay guys, uh, everything looks good here. We're just going to go outside for a moment and I'm going to do a quick radiation scan of the plane, okay? It's just that simple and easy. And according to Brian, this is how most border crossings go. Each general aviation flight that arrives in the United States and is processed through Customs and Border Protection is treated pretty much the same. We are really focused on the, not the 99% of the legitimate pilots out there. We're looking for that 1% who has harmful intent or is trying to bring something contrary to law into the United States. I've only had one incident where I've actually had to seize an aircraft. And that was a gentleman who was actually departing the United States and he was smuggling weapons and gunpowder. He was flying onward to Africa. So we did seize the aircraft and we actually held it for only about 24 hours because he was the pilot in command, but he wasn't the owner of the aircraft. We didn't feel it was right. We didn't believe that the leaseholder of the aircraft knew the pilot's intentions. So the pilot got in trouble and the owners got their airplane back. Unfortunately, this sort of 1% horror story is what people tend to hear about. Customs agents in any country do have laws to uphold and a country to protect. However, they try to make the process as painless as possible. And the last thing they want to do is to scare people away from visiting. The last thing in the world we want to do is intimidate the general aviation pilot. We want you to fly into the United States. We've made the steps as easy and as user-friendly as possible, and all of our officers will work with you on your entry. All right, that's it. Yep. Well, we're through clearing customs here at Chicago's Executive Airport, and it was pleasant as usual, and we look forward to our next visit. Luckily, our trip into the United States only involves two border crossings, one into the U.S. and another one back into Canada. But pilot Robert Gannon in his Cessna 182 has had to make countless border crossings. He's been on a nine-year odyssey which has taken him around the world. Robert recently touched down in Lucky Lady 2 at the Brampton Flying Club where the aviators had a chance to speak to him about his incredible journey. Bob, thanks for visiting with us. Nice to be here. Around the world, Bob, literally, how many countries have you been in with this aircraft? Well, Lucky Lady 2 and I have been to 155 countries on all the continents. We've been west around the world in the southern hemisphere. We've been east around the world in the northern hemisphere, down to Antarctica and over the North Pole. In fact, Robert and his aircraft hold world records for having landed in the most countries and at the largest number of different airfields. While the pilots who have gone around the world the quickest usually get the most notoriety, speed is not Robert's goal. His journey started in 2000 in San Diego, California, and he's been crisscrossing the globe ever since. I left uh, almost 10 years ago on this adventure. I'll f fly so far, then I park the plane uh, and take a commercial plane back home to take care of business and rob a bank to get some money to go back and do it again. So I've parked the plane uh, now 37 different places in the world in that uh, nine and a half years. And how far from the completion of your journey? I've had about six months left. Uh, this leg, I'm heading now from uh, Toronto up into eastern Canada, Labrador, up to the top of Quebec, and then back down into the United States. I have landed in all of the states east of uh, the Mississippi and all the provinces of Canada. I still have all the states west of the Mississippi and a bit more of western Mexico before I end up back in San Diego, California, where I started nine and a half years ago. Lucky Lady 2 is registered in California, but since his departure, the aircraft hasn't spent any time there. The initial leg of Robert's journey was the longest. Robert had to fly 18 hours from San Diego to Hawaii. With an 18-hour journey, we asked him what he would do to occupy his time. People oftentimes ask me, what do I do for 18 hours? Do I read a book? Do I listen to music? 
No, I have one engine, so I like to listen to the engine. Now I have to, because I don't have an autopilot, I have to fly the airplane. So one out of every four moments is readjusting your heading because as you're flying for such a long period of time, the sun's constantly moving and you tend to stay where you were. So you very easy to be 10 or 15 degrees off of course. When you're flying ocean, a foot short still short. So you want to you want to make sure you're going to get to where you want to be. This trip isn't the first time that Bob has attempted a flight around the world. In 1992, he took off in a Cherokee 6 and headed for Paris, France. Unfortunately, the trip was ended prematurely when he crashed the plane in Kenya. But this setback didn't stop Robert. He continued to fly for many years before attempting another trip. When you started this whole journey, you had how many hours? Well, uh, in 1992, I left uh, with 160 hours for Paris, and I crashed in Kenya with 295 hours in my logbook. And then for the, for the next eight years, I belonged to a flying club and just would go out and fly, but always thought about finishing that trip. So then 10 years ago, I bought Lucky Lady 2. I've put about 2,000 hours on this twice around the world so far, and the original about 300 hours, and I've only got maybe a couple other 100 hours, so I'm maybe a 2,600 hour pilot uh, with most of those flying to a new airport in the world. How do you prepare and, and deal with uh, going into some countries that you know, most general aviation pilots probably wouldn't think to fly into? Uh, I think probably an open mind. And uh, people say, well, why do you do this? I'd have to say curiosity. I'm just curious. Uh, and I'm not afraid to do it. Flying across water in a single engine never scared me. Most commercial and good pilots, it does. You know, I've been into Iran, Syria. I flew into Iraq on a medical mission with Lucky Lady. Oftentimes, from a distance, something looks, looks like it's insurmountable. But if you'll get right up to the front door and knock, you'd be surprised how often the door opens up. And doors have opened up for Robert all around the world, including the Middle East. There he flew in formation with the Royal Jordanian Falcons, the Kingdom of Jordan's aerobatic demonstration team. According to Robert, this is not unusual, as in his experience, aviation bonds pilots regardless of where they fly in the world. For the most part, the people of the world are as good as people anywhere in the world. In aviation, I almost always leave my airplane to 36 different places with a pilot or with a mechanic. Uh, aviation is an extremely tight organization. Everybody that's learned to fly a plane knows all the procedures, and the pilots in the world are, are, are extremely tight fraternal group, and they're always willing to help someone that comes, shows up by themselves along, and, and what do you need, how can I help you? that sort of thing. So I, I cannot say enough about the pilots of the world. It's a beautiful day in Polk City, Florida. We're on Lake Agnes at the Fantasy of Flight. Every year, hundreds of people make the pilgrimage down to this mecca of float planes. They've got a twin CB, a Beaver, Cessna 172s on floats, as well as some ultralights. If you're a pilot and you like seaplanes, you need to come. While only a one-day event, the Sun and Fun Splash In is a chance for float pilots to get together amidst the hustle and bustle of the much larger Sun and Fun Fly-In. It makes perfect sense that amphibian and float plane pilots would look to gather in their natural habitat. A wide variety of aircraft took part in Splash In, from Cessnas on floats to amphibious seaplanes such as the Lake or Seabee. Of course, organizing any sort of mass fly-in is a big job, and coordinating an event like this on water has additional challenges. To find out all about it, we spoke to event organizer Sharon Stebbins. What sort of problems do you encounter when organizing something like this? Well, there's logistics as far as buses are concerned, and bus schedules and bus drivers, and then of course you have all different positions that have to be filled in the tent. We have registration, getting the banquet tickets sold. We uh, need to sell more or sell less, one or the other. Let's see. <laughs> Handicapped people that want to come in and, and we need to get them in here and yet accommodate them, but yet at the same time have their cars not parked in here. 
Events like this are largely dependent on volunteers. From people parking airplanes to coordinating performances and competitions, everyone who takes part is doing it for the love of aviation and the enjoyment of being with other pilots. And happy volunteers come back year after year. Well, we have over 40 volunteers just in Seabirds alone. And so, like I say, it's scheduling all of them and putting them where they want to. And it all has to do with the people. If, if the job doesn't get done, you just move on and you try. And a lot of these volunteers have been here for a couple of years or more. Like one just said, oh, don't forget I was 10 years. You know, this is my 10th year. So we got to make note of that. But a lot of them even longer than that. And they say, put me in the same position. So that makes it a lot easier when you're scheduling to put them in. You just look at what they did last year and you put them in this year and next year and so forth. For non-pilots, aside from seeing all of the unique seaplanes, there are planned events for spectators. Kermit Weeks from Fantasy of Flight took to the air in his Grumman J2F Duck and entertained the crowds. This unique amphibious biplane saw service in the Second World War with both the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard. Also taking place were a number of competitions, including a grapefruit drop, spot landing, and fastest takeoff competition. <laughs> Huge. This has really been a great day. At least the wind has stayed down the 10 to 15 like it was forecast. If it had gone up for 10 to 20, it, a lot of these planes would still wouldn't be able to fly, especially the ultralights and the kites and the smaller planes. Have any of the planes not been able to get in because of the wind today, or have you been, been pretty nope. lucky with that? They, they've all come in. They've Wonderful. all done it. Uh, the widgeon that went out earlier, he was afraid he might not be able to get on because of the winds, but he made it, and it was wonderful, and it's a beautiful airplane. And... We had a chance to talk to one of the fastest takeoff competitors about his unique home-built float plane. The plane here is a little over 400 pounds, and it's a 65 horsepower powered. Those floats are home-built also. Basically a snowmobile engine, it's a Rotex which has been converted to air aviation use. Four years old, it's a um, micro mong, it's a replica of a 1950s pylon air racer. It'll run along at 90 mile an hour cruise, which is pretty good for a little plane. The wingspan on that is only 19 feet six. It's what we call a scratch built. All I get was a set of drawings, and then you start getting tubing and learn how to weld. It's a, that's the great thing about the home-built movement, is that the FAA, it's licensed for educational purposes. So you get to use woods, you get to learn how to weld, go to schools, and so on and so forth. I'm a certified aircraft welder now, 60 hours of welding. This is my eighth airplane, so probably if I was starting out to build this as an amateur the way I did 40 years ago, probably take 1,500 hours. You know, you, you, you learn how to plan in advance. In the end, the event was a success with well over 60 airplanes taking part and an ample number of spectators. The seaplane's pilots had an opportunity to get together and swap stories and techniques. For Sharon, this sense of community with fellow seabirds is the reason she and her husband continue to fly a lake and dedicate their time to this sort of event. Do you have a lot of young people trying to get involved in the splashing? Uh, sadly to say no, but a lot of new seaplane pilots really want to. and. Uh... And that's the thing, seaplanes, we've been land pilots for many, many, many years. We've been married for 48 years, and we bought our first airplane the first year we were married, within six months of marriage. It was important to us. And we were always been land planes, and finally we figured in the age factor and bought the seaplane, and it's the best thing we've ever done. It's the best of all worlds, the best of boating world and flying world, and you have a whole new group of friends, and it's, it's incredibly exciting. As aviators, we get to fly over incredible scenery. As this constant landscape of trees and lakes passes under our wings, it can be easy to take it all for granted. Many of the areas we fly over, however, may be facing environmental and man-made challenges. The boreal forest is one of the world's greatest remaining forests. In North America, it stretches from Alaska in the northwest all the way to Newfoundland in the east. A conservation group called the Canadian Boreal Initiative is spearheading protection and conservation efforts of this vast resource.
But this TV series is about aviators, not forests, and that's where Larry Innes comes in. Larry flies a Lake Buccaneer, and he uses the airplane in his passion of conserving the boreal forest. Larry is the director of the Canadian Boreal Initiative. We spoke to Larry on the southern edge of the boreal in Ottawa, Ontario. The boreal is very important as one of the last large intact forests left on Earth. It stores carbon, it provides clean water, it provides clean air, and it provides habitat for large migratory species like caribou, and predators like wolves and bears, and for communities, including First Nations who've lived there for thousands of years. And there are very few places on Earth left like it. The boreal is a subarctic forest with most of the forest lying above the 50th parallel. A lot of the communities that lie within are remote and inaccessible by anything other than aircraft. Having to get in and out of remote destinations every day made it necessary for Larry to get his own aircraft. The only problem was, when Larry got the idea of using a plane, he was missing one very important thing, a pilot's license. Flying is an absolute essential part of how I do my job. The, the work that we do in remote communities either requires flying on all too few commercial flights or chartering, which is prohibitively expensive. Being able to show up in a community, to be self-reliant, to travel on your own schedule or on one that suits the community is a huge advantage in allowing us to do what we do and where we do it. So learning to fly myself was uh, a very cost-effective option and it provides great opportunities to get into places that I otherwise wouldn't be able to go. Over 80% of the world's liquid freshwater is stored in the boreal watershed. As a result, when Larry was looking for an aircraft, an Amphib was the perfect choice. Well, this is a Lake Buccaneer and it's a uh, 1971 uh, model with a 200 horsepower engine. It's basically the aviation equivalent of a Jeep. It's small and it's rugged and it'll take you anywhere from a big urban airport to a small lake in the back of beyond in the boreal. And it's equally at home in either place. The design of the Lake Buccaneer dates back to the 1940s. Originally called the C-2 Skimmer, the aircraft was renamed the LA-4200 Buccaneer when the Lake Aircraft Company was formed in 1959. Well over a thousand of these aircraft were built. The standard power plant is a 200 horsepower Lycoming IO360 engine in a pusher configuration. What this means is that instead of the conventional configuration of the prop facing forward and pulling the aircraft, in the Buccaneer, the propeller faces backwards and pushes the aircraft. So the advantages of having the uh, engine and the propeller in a pusher configuration up on top are twofold. One, it keeps the prop out of the water, which is a very big advantage. And the second is that it gives you maximum thrust for the power of the engine. There's no fuselage in the way. So it makes the 200 horses work very hard getting this off the water. While Larry seems to like the pusher prop, not everyone feels the same way. For pilots used to flying traditionally configured aircraft, the flight characteristics take some getting used to. When you apply power, most pilots expect the nose to pitch up, and when you reduce power, they would expect the nose to drop. On the Lake Buccaneer with its pusher prop, the opposite happens, which can be a little unnerving for pilots transitioning from a Cessna to a Lake Buccaneer. But of course, with practice, any pilot could adjust and master the lake. The use of an aircraft has dramatically changed the way Larry does his job. It's opened up the versatility of being able to go where he wants, when he wants, and not be dependent on someone else's schedule. So for anyone thinking about getting their license, Larry has one thing to say. I would say get out there and do it. It's an opportunity that, that opens so many doors, that allows such opportunities to get out and see the country, to experience nature, and to work in places that other modes of transportation just don't let you get there. And flying is truly a tool for doing the kind of work that we do in Canada's Boreal. The aviators for everyone who has ever gazed skywards 